Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Security of Classic Game Consoles. So I have the pleasure of speaking um, after you all have eaten lunch, um, and you've got that, that food coma, coma going on, but then they had the snack where we've loaded you up with donuts and sugar, so now you're all hyped up and amped up, and so let's ready for a fun talk uh, to uh, end your, almost end your Strange Loop conference. My name is Kevin Shackleton. I am a distinguished engineer at a company called Cerner that's based in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, we do healthcare IT software and services. I've been there for 15 years, and one of my responsibilities is uh, the security of all of our software. So I get to work with all the teams at Cerner to ensure that we're, um, we have secure coding principles, that we're, that we're um, including security as a first-class design concern of our software. As you can tell from the, from the title of my presentation, the music uh, that I had going on before here, the slides up here, I am a fan of classic gaming. And so with this talk today, I want to marry my passions with security and classic gaming into one, and so let's get started. So growing up, I was uh, completely enamored with Nintendo. Nintendo was my life. Um, in fourth grade for my birthday, after begging my parents for several years, they finally got me this Nintendo right here. And I played this Nintendo incessantly. Um, I had a subscription to Nintendo Power, and I read each issue cover to cover um, repeatedly. I got as, uh, my hands on as many games as possible. I almost got a Nintendo Power Glove. <laughs> uh, but my sister, who is three years younger, I tried to convince her to pool our allowance money together to purchase a Power Glove. And that worked for a couple weeks until she realized that it was just for me. And she quickly wised up, so uh, alas, I did not get that. Um, but Nintendo actually came about at an interesting time. Um, so actually, before Nintendo was companies like Atari with Atari 2600 and arcades. Those were very prevalent. But something happened in 1983 that we now refer to as the video game crash of 1983, or Atari shock, in which the video game market completely collapsed overnight, going from a $3 billion market to $100 million. Now, there are a few factors that we attribute to the crash, um, one of them being competition from home computers. So video game systems consoles could only play video games, but home computers could play video games and do exciting things like do spreadsheets and word processors. Um, so video games were seen as a fad, but also you had a glut of consoles uh, that were out at the time, and more importantly, a glut of console games. So the Atari 2600, the most popular system of that time, had hundreds upon hundreds of games produced for it, one of them being the uh, lovely E.T. game, which you can see in a landfill here. Um, most of the games were, were completely terrible, and parents and kids don't, didn't know which, um, which games uh, were good. And so for two years, this crash happened. So from 83 to 85, um, the market was pretty much dead. People thought video games were a fad. Until the fall of 1985, when in the U.S., Nintendo released the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now note they called it the Nintendo Entertainment System, not the Nintendo Video Game System or the Nintendo Video Console, because video games were a bad word, and the Nintendo could do more than video games. You could play with your Robbie the Robot there, um, that you know, obviously no one ever did because everyone just played games. So it was, it was really a gaming console. But you know, with the Nintendo, they, they were coming out in this time where video games were a bad word. Um, it, it was pretty much a dead market, and they did not want to repeat the same mistakes that happened in the past. So they did something that no one else had really uh, uh, tried before, which was for every Nintendo game sold, it had this seal from Nintendo that said, this seal is your assurance that Nintendo has approved and guaranteed the quality of this product. Now, for those who are familiar with this game here, Friday the 13th, you'll know that this is uh, infamous for being one of the worst video games of all time. So it's certainly not deserving of this, this seal of approval from Nintendo here. So that's not what this seal approval was all about. It was not about quality. Actually, what the seal meant was that, as a developer, your game had to be on the Nintendo for two years and only on the Nintendo, no other system. So you were locked in. So the Friday the 13th developers, you know, Nintendo was the lucky system that got that game for two years. As a developer, you can only produce five games a year. So Nintendo immediately constrained the market. So developers couldn't pump out games left and right. You had just five games that you could release in a year. Before Apple made content review, the, you know, the latest uh, cool thing with iOS, Nintendo was doing it back 
on the NES, and so they went, all games went through a content review with Nintendo. And then finally, and this is the crucial bit here, Nintendo controlled all the manufacturing of the game. So every game cartridge sold was produced by Nintendo. And that's how they ensured they got a cut of every game sold. So as a developer, you'd go to Nintendo and say, I want to produce a million copies of my game. And Nintendo might say, well, we're only going to let you do 500,000. And you'll say, OK, that's fine. And then Nintendo would say, and we want all the money up front to produce those games, even if we're going to spread it out over, say, a couple year period. You'd have to upfront all that money. And then any unsold inventory uh, that you had, you just had to eat that. So these terms seem incredibly lopsided, right? They favor Nintendo. So why would any developer agree to them? Well, the developers were forced to because Nintendo made security a first-class design consideration when building the NES, unlike other systems. And we're going to talk a little, about, a little bit about that in a second. So first, let's transition away from uh, the terrible Friday the 13th, and let's talk about the awesome Mega Man 2. So for those of you who were in here earlier, yeah, you can clap for Mega Man 2, it's fine. Yeah. So the music I had playing was from Mega Man 2, and this is uh, one of my favorite games of all time. Um, I, I got this uh, game as a kid, played it constantly. This was one of the first games that I beat. So as a kid, like, I got a lot of satisfaction that I was able to beat this game. Um, and it, it's just, it's regarded as a fantastic video game. So like I said, I brought with me today my, my Nintendo. I've modified it a bit. I've also brought with me a copy of Mega Man 2. Um, and what I'd like to do, if you'd indulge me a bit, is I'd like to continue my presentation from my modified Mega Man 2, and I want to talk about the security of not only the Nintendo, but other video game systems, and how can we learn from those principles and the software and systems we build today. So let's, uh, if we could switch to the uh, VGA input there. Thank you. And... Of course. We have to blow on it, you know, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's see here. All right, so we've got Mega Man 2. I've made a little bit of modifications for Strange Loop here. Uh, let's actually make one more modification. Ah, much better, okay. All right, so let's start here. Now, thankfully, the designers of Mega Man 2 designed the game so that there was an, uh, the exact number of bosses as the systems and things I wanted to talk about. So certainly, I didn't shoehorn anything in here. Um, we already talked about the crash uh, and kind of a precursor to our talk today. So let's get into our first system. And let's look at the Intellivision 2. So this system actually predated Nintendo. This was uh, before the video game crash. And the Intellivision 2 uh, was created by a company called Mattel. So we all know Mattel. Um, and Mattel actually uh, created the Intellivision first. And they made their own games for the Intellivision, but so did other companies. One of those companies was Coleco. So Coleco would produce games for the Intellivision, um, but Intellivision didn't see a dime from, from those games. And then ColecoVision released a system called the ColecoVision. Now, I don't know about you guys, but something looks very familiar about these two systems. <laughs> Uh, ColecoVision, uh, you know, shamelessly stole the amazing controller and keypad design for their ColecoVision. Uh, all joking aside, the ColecoVision is actually my second favorite system. I grew up playing that before the Nintendo. It's a fantastic uh, gaming console. Um, but, you know, and Mattel was not happy that Coleco was competing both in the gaming market and now the hardware market. So when they released the Intellivision 2, when you turned it on and put in a game, and let me jump back here before the code, is you got, uh, you, you got this green screen that says Mattel Electronics presents the name of the game, which came from the ROM of the game, and then a, a copyright, um, and then the, the copyright uh, year and company also from the ROM. And when you took, the Intellivision 2 was a backwards compatible system, so when you took Intellivision games and plugged them in Intel, into the Intellivision 2, everything worked. When you took those Coleco games, though, that were made for the Intellivision, they did not work on the Intellivision 2. And why is that? Well, when the Intellivision 2 booted up, the exec processor, executive ROM that, that was built into the system had this check in there, which basically it said, is bit six of address 500C set? If not, then halt and don't load the game. And if that bit was set, then it checks the copyright year in the header, and it says if it's between 1978 and 1982, then it allows the game to play. If not, then it halts. Well, the Mattel branded games, the, the games made for Mattel, 
um, all of these checks passed and they were able to play. But those Coleco games that were made for the Intellivision did not have these values set, and so they didn't, uh, the game would not load. So this is a very rudimentary, but it's, I, I call this out because it's the first um, attempt at security with, with consoles. Now this was easily defeated um, by Coleco, but by that time we had the crash of 83, and so it was all moot. Um, so, but it's just interesting nonetheless. Now let's talk about Nintendo. So let's move on back to our Nintendo. And, and by the way, if you don't appreciate these transitions, it's through every single one, so you'll have to, <laughs> you'll have to get used to it. I went all in here. So if we open up our Nintendo, I, I mentioned that security was, Nintendo considered that a design concern of the, the NES. So if I were to take the cover off my Nintendo here, um, the cartridge slides in from the bottom, so we're looking at a top-down view. And if we look at this particular chip here, and I'm going to zoom into this chip, this chip is called the NES Checking Integrated Circuit, uh, but we just call it the 10NES chip. So the 10NES chip is in every single Nintendo console, and if I were to open up my Mega Man 2 cartridge, inside of that cartridge is that circuit board, and the exact same 10NES chip is in the cartridge. Okay, so it's the exact same chip. Now, in the console, the chip acts as a lock, and in the cartridge, it, it acts as a key. Now, we know Nintendo produces all the consoles, and if you remember, Nintendo produces and manufactures every cartridge. So that's how they're able to put this chip into every cartridge. Now, when your Nintendo console boots up, the uh, 10NES chip here uh, on the console generates a seed, so a random number, that it then sends to the 10NES chip, or the key, in the cartridge. So now both the two 10S chips have the same seed. They're both the same chips. They do the same um, arithmetic calculations. The chip in the cartridge sends the result back to the console, the lock, and uh, the lock compares the result. If the result matches, then all is good, and it then does this all over again. If the results don't match for any reason or there's some sort of communication problem, the chip in the console sends the reset command to the CPU. So you know how when I blew on the cartridge because I was getting the flashing red light and not getting the game to come on? And when that happened to you as a kid, what that really was was that your game was not getting a good connection to the console, and it's specifically to the 10S chip, and it was setting a reset command. So your game comes up, it flashes, resets, and keeps doing that over and over again. So when you think we're blowing the dust out of the, the cartridge of the console, we're really not. It's really the insertion um, into the cartridge that um, just repeatedly just gets it a better connection. Now, thankfully, uh, Nintendo patented the 10 NES chip, and so we have schematics for it, and we have a description for how it works. And uh, one of the interesting things is that um, buried into, the, in, into this patent is a description as how does the chip know that it's a lock when it's in the console versus if it's in the cartridge, it's the key. And that's because, and the way they do that is the console has power, right? This is plugged in, it's drawing power. And in that mode, uh, it's, the chip is getting positive 5 volts of power, which means that it's going to operate in lock mode. The cartridge doesn't have any power, so it um, operates in key mode. But there's this error scenario that's called out that's very interesting that says, in the situation in which you have a key-key combination or lock-lock combination, so you don't have the combination of lock and key, then the chip does nothing. It doesn't reset the CPU. So it's effectively if there's no security in place. And that's actually our first attack vector. So if we go and snip pin four on the lower left-hand corner of the chip here, we disconnect its power, that positive five volts. And now this chip acts as a key. So we're now in a key-key configuration. It doesn't reset the CPU. All is good. So you can go and mod your Nintendo and just snip that, snip that pin, and everything works fine. Now, in security, this principle uh, is called that you know, in this design, they're failing open. So in a fail open design, um, in the case of an error, there's like no security. So for instance, if we're in a room and there's normally locked doors that don't let um, access to the outside, like say maybe this door, but there's like a fire or some emergency, you'd want it to fail open so we don't get trapped in the room and we can get out. So that's a case where fail open is fine. Um, but in this case, we probably don't want to fail open because we can easily dismantle the security here. Uh, a fail-closed design would be where, in this error scenario, it would still continue to reset the CPU so it, um, you know, it, it doesn't allow things to proceed. Now, there's another attack vector here, which is we can knock this 10S chip offline. So Nintendo produced all the cartridges, and all their cartridges um, don't have any power to them, right? 
well, what if we produced a malicious cartrid cartridge that sent negative five volts back to our console, which would negate the positive five volts that our 10 nest chip gets. And so now it knocks it offline, turns it effectively into a key, and we could disable security that way. And actually, there was developers who produced cartridges that did just that. Nintendo didn't anticipate that, or in the security world we talk about, they weren't checking their inputs, right? So Nintendo actually fixed this in later revisions of the NES where they added some diodes in to protect against unwanted voltages, um, to protect against this attack. But it's an interesting uh, thing to consider that you know, Nintendo thought they were the only ones that you know, could possibly produce cartridges, but really a malicious attacker could do uh, so as well. And then the final attack vector with the NES is that you know, we have this, this key in here, or th this lock and this key. Um, effectively, they're sharing a symmetric secret uh, between each other. We have access to those, so we can reverse engineer that and simply um, clone our own key. And that's actually what a developer called TenGen did. So here is Gauntlet from TenGen. You can tell this doesn't look like a normal Nintendo cartridge. It's black. It has a slightly different shape. Um, but this cartridge has a clone of the 10S chip that they called the Rabbit chip in here. Now, what's interesting is TenGen is actually uh, a subsidy of a company called Atari. So Atari made Nintendo games under 10Gen, and they didn't want to pay Nintendo licensing fees. So they reverse engineered the 10 NES chip, put it in their cartridges, and the game would play. Now, Nintendo actually sued 10, uh, Atari, um, and uh, actually, Nintendo won their suit. Um, the court ruled that um, if you know, 10Gen just simply reverse engineered the 10 NES chip, everything would have been fine. However, they didn't do it in a clean room environment. So as it turns out, um, an employee of TenGen went to the US Copyright Office where Nintendo had um, stored a copy of the code for the 10 NES chip, and they obtained that code so they could aid in their reverse engineering of the chip. Um, so Nintendo did prevail there. So the lesson learned here is, you know, these effectively are symmetric secrets. Um, we have access to them, so someone could reverse engineer them. So uh, symmetric secrets are only good if the attacker has no way to access that secret. Now let's move on to uh, our next system, the Sega Genesis. So the Sega Genesis, one of the first 16-bit systems, um, they also had a seal, their own seal, the Sega Seal of Quality. Um, and when you turned on your Genesis and put in a Genesis game, you were greeted with this screen, produced by or under license from Sega Enterprises. Um, and this actually was documented in Sega's developer kit, so this was not a secret as to um, what they were doing here. So the Sega, the Sega Trademark Security System, or TMSS, checks to see if the word Sega is in memory address 100, and if so, it goes ahead and loads the game. Now, this was, this was documented in their, in their developer SDK, so uh, they weren't trying to hide this like in, like in television or Mattel was. So instead, Sega's security measure was interesting in that they were going for both a trademark and a licensing kind of legal maneuver here, where um, if you as a developer had the word Sega in your code, but you were not a licensed developer, Sega would go after you and say, hey, that's a, that's a uh, trademark infringement. And <laughs> when the black screen came up that said this game was produced or licensed by Sega, well, that'd be a lie because it actually wasn't, and so they went after you for that. And so they actually sued a developer for this accolade um, in 92. Sega initially won, but then they ended up losing on appeal. And the appeals court ruled that accolade um, was it within their means to go ahead and reverse engineer the Genesis because they had it in their possession and they could do whatever they wanted with it. Um, and this was actually a very influential case that is cited in other reverse engineering cases throughout history. So next, let's talk about another Sega system, the Sega Saturn. So the Sega Saturn was uh, notable for being um, one of the first systems that employed CD uh, media for their, for their uh, gaming. So we, we moved away from cartridges and moved to CDs. Um, and the Saturn uh, game CDs were actually just like regular CDs, with one small exception. So the Saturn Sega CDs had this ring, this outer ring that normal CD-ROM readers cannot write or read. And in this outer ring was a, a signature that we call the static wobble signature. And this signature was basically a private key that Sega would encode into each one of the games. So Sega, for the Saturn, produced all of the games, um, which allowed them to get those licensing fees. Now, 
Before I talk about how this was broken, I'd like to shift and talk about a paper from 1975 called The Protection of Information in Computer Systems by Salzer and Schroeder. This is a fantastic research paper. I know research papers can sometimes be difficult to read, but this one is very easy to read, and it's so relevant still today. This paper goes through various security principles um, when building computer systems, and all of them are st still apply today. And so for all the rest of the, the measures I'm going to talk about today, I want to kind of relate those back to this paper because it's really interesting. So one of the security principles they talk about in this paper is a concept called work factor. And work factor is something that um, we're very familiar with today with cryptography and passwords. And work factor basically says um, for an attacker, uh, you can compute, uh, in some cases, you can compute the amount of work it would take to compromise the system. And some cases, though, the work factor um, is not easily um, calculated. But in the case of like cryptography with passwords, um, you can say, OK, we know here's how many um, possible password combinations there are. Here's how many hashes I can compute, say, per second. And so you know the work factor it would take you to crack the, um, a given password. So with work factor, you want the amount of work that an attacker has to expend to be less than the value of the thing you're trying to attack. OK, so um, in other words, an attacker is not going to want to spend time and energy and effort, and the payoff is you know, not worth it in the end because it took them too long. Um, so the Sega Saturn CD security, it's an extremely high work, fa work factor because in order to break it, we have to create our own CD writer capable of writing on a regular CD disk that security signature to you know, counterfeit a Saturn game. And in fact, no one has actually done this. So no one has uh, produced a, uh, a Saturn CD burner um, to burn you know, Saturn games. It's just, it just hasn't been broken. So does that mean that the Saturn has, you know, this security measure has never been broken? Not quite. So in that paper, when they talk about work factor, they talk about that if the work factor is too high, um, that defeat of the security measure is often obtained through indirect means. And that's exactly what happened with the Saturn. So instead of attacking the CD, the format of the CD in that static wobble signature, instead, attackers went after it with a disk swap attack, which was where you put in a legitimate disk. Um, it reads the, the console reads the security signature on that legitimate, legitimate disk, and then you yank that out and put in your burn disk, and it'll read the game data from that. So it's effectively a timing-based attack. Another way that the Saturn's been hacked is simply through modding it, right? We have the console in our possession. We can modify the, the circuits. Um, and and uh, one notable um, console hacker actually uh, about a year, year and a half ago, um, modded his Saturn to load games off of a, uh, a USB stick. So there's lots of different ways uh, to attack systems. Um, so you know, work factor is, uh, came into play here. The next system I want to talk about is the Sony PlayStation. So the Sony PlayStation is a system I'm sure everyone is uh, familiar with. It was very popular in the 90s. Um, it also used a, a disk-based system like the Saturn. And like the Saturn, it was a regular CD-ROM with a, uh, a special you know, secret uh, signature or key that was written on the outer edges. Um, but the PlayStation was attacked uh, even easier than the, the, the Saturn. And that's due to a, a design flaw. So the way the PlayStation would work normally is when you put in a CD, it would read the, uh, the CD-ROM signature, that wobble region data. And it, they actually used it for more region control um, so that you couldn't play, say, a Japanese game in the US or a US game in, in Japan. Um, F, as long as that checked out, it, that signature checked out, which as it turns out was just four characters um, on the, the edge of the disk, um, it would then read some license screen text uh, from the, the disk and kind of display that on the screen. So this, we're kind of marrying a, uh, the, the static signature from the Saturn plus the, the Genesis kind of like copyright uh, um, security, the kind of legal maneuvering there. Um, but I want to call your attention to the back of the PlayStation here. So in the back of the PlayStation, in the lower left-hand corner, is a parallel port. And this, with this parallel port, it had access to pretty much the whole system. So attackers were able to, to create a device that plugged into the parallel port that when the laser on the, C on the, the console was, was reading the signature on the disk, and if you had a burn disk that didn't have that, it wouldn't find it, 
Well, the device in the parallel port would inject into the data stream the expected characters. So it was able to hijack that data stream and put in those characters. And so the game, the, the OS thought that it was reading the data from the disk when in fact it's coming from the parallel port. And then that license screen text that it needed to read from the game to display the, the uh, copyright screen or the licensing screen when you started up the PlayStation, it would tell the console, the parallel port, the device on the parallel port would tell the console, I want you to switch disks. And in a multi-disc game, the second disk did not have that license text, and so the, the game console would just ignore it and not display that. So they kind of avoided all that. Now, if we go back to our 1975 paper, there's a concept they talk about called principle of least privilege, and that's the entities and, and actors in your system should have uh, only the necessary privileges um, to operate and nothing more. And so if we talk about our PlayStation here and look at it, the parallel port probably has no business to be able to inject data into the data stream coming off of the laser um, or to tell the system that it should change disks. Uh, that should come from the game itself. Um, and when we, talk, when we think about the systems we build today, like when we're running our applications on a server, we don't want them to run as root, right? Because um, that has way too many privileges. Instead, we'd want to run it as a, a less privileged user. So, Sony actually wised up to this, and so this is the, how the PlayStation looked in 1994, and five years later in 1999, <laughs> they removed the parallel port. So rather than reducing the privileges on the parallel port, they just removed it altogether, which as it turns out, is another security principle from our favorite paper from 1975. And they call that economy of mechanism. Now, this is kind of an awkward term, I think, but today we use this term all the time, but just in a different form, with KISS, or keep it simple, stupid. And what economy of mechanism describes is that the more simple your system is, the less moving parts, uh, you know, the smaller you can make it, the easier it is to reason about your system, the easier it is to understand all the code paths, the easier it is to test it. And given two systems, one more complex than the other, the simpler system will be far easier to secure and should have less security bugs. And that's exactly what Sony did here. Just by removing the parallel port, they just removed an, you know, a whole attack vector here and simplified um, the design of the PlayStation. And as it turns out, that parallel port was actually never even used for uh, anything other than people hacking their consoles. <laughs> so now let's go back to Sega and let's talk about the Sega Dreamcast. So the Sega Dreamcast uh, was a great system. Um, uh, unfortunately, it didn't do so great in the market, um, and also, unfortunately, it was, it was crippled with a, a severe security vulnerability. Now, recall that uh, Sega, when they had with the Saturn, they had that proprietary format with that static signature on around the outer edge, and the Dreamcast uh, employed something similar. So, the Dreamcast uh, could read audio CDs, and it, all of the games came in this format that was brand new from Sega, a proprietary format called GD-ROM. So normal CDs could hold up to you know, 650 or 700 megs. GD-ROMs were gigabyte disks. Um, and Sega, of course, produced all the, they pressed all the GD-ROMs. So again, like the Saturn, uh, with this proprietary format, they're the only ones capable of writing these disks. They're the only ones capable of reading it in terms of the, the Dreamcast reader. Um, so you think that, and also, you know, we can't just do what, like what we did with the Saturn and, and burn a, a, a regular CD because these are gigabit uh, or gigabyte uh, games, not uh, games that fit on just a regular CD. So you know, we've got some challenges here, but there's a third format that this, the Dreamcast was able to read. And that's another proprietary format from Sega called Mill CD. And I'm sure most of you have not heard this format. Um, Sega introduced it thinking that they were going to create this great new audio CD with like a hybrid of a data CD. This would be like this interactive audio CD. So it's really an audio CD plus executable code. And when we add executable code to things, that never works out well. <laughs> um, so these are the three formats the Dreamcast could support. And so attackers, they knew, okay, we're not going to go and try to you know, uh, create our own GD-ROM writers or, or readers or media. So what if we could take a GD-ROM disk and put that on a mill CD because that has executable code, and that's exactly what they did. So using the Dreamcast itself, they put in a legitimate game. They would stream the data um, off of the Dreamcast on, and send that to uh, a computer so they could dump the games. 
Then most games actually fit on a normal 700 meg CD, but for those that didn't, they would just downsample art or music to get it to fit onto a regular CD-ROM. And they burned that CD-ROM in the mill CD format, which while it was proprietary from um, Sega, uh, the, they uh, pr published how you could produce your own mill CD uh, formatted uh, discs. And so there was no audio on the mill CD, there was just a bunch of data that happened to be the game from the GD-ROM. And so the Dreamcast would play that uh, uh, just like a, a normal game here. And so the lesson learned here is that attacks follow the path of least resistance. So attackers are not going to go the hard route of trying to reverse engineer how to press and, and make their own GD-ROMs. Um, they're just going to see how can they exploit these other formats that exist um, or other attack vectors that exist on the Dreamcast. So we've talked about some classic gaming consoles, and now I'm going to look a bit at some systems today. So I know this talk is focused on classic gaming consoles, but we can learn even more if we take a look at the console systems that are coming out today. <laughs> so today, with modern consoles, the work factor is just too high, um, meaning that no one is modding consoles anymore. Um, you're not taking your your Wii or your Switch or your GameCube and trying to mod it. It's too risky. The systems are really complex. Uh, the, the component tree is getting more and more integrated, so it's harder to reverse engineer this for you know, a single person to do that. Um, and the, you know, the media is, is all digital, right? So we, we've moved away from, from physical media. So um, some of these other systems, you know, like the, the GameCube had, had these really small disks that you couldn't burn, so you couldn't even take a regular CD. So it's just really difficult. Um, so attackers moved away from the hardware and the, the physical media and instead went to something that we're all familiar with, which is the software. So now all the attacks are happening all in the software. So with the GameCube, that was rooted through this game, or one of the ways it was rooted through this game called Fantasy Star Online. Fantasy Star Online was an online game, and you, could, uh, you connected to the, the, the server from uh, Sega, the manufacturer of the game, and in the game, you could um, put in some network settings to connect to their server, one of those being a DNS server. So attackers figured out that if they put in a DNS server that they controlled, they could use DNS hijacking to when the game requested, say, fantasystaronline.com, the DNS server that the attacker controlled actually told it, hey, that server is available at this IP address, which is another server that the attacker controls. And so the game then connects to that. Server. So now the game is thinking that it's connecting to a legitimate server, but it's really um, connecting to the attacker's uh, malicious server. That malicious server then told the game, hey, uh, Fantasy Star Online, I have an update for you. You need to take this patch and run this code. And the game said, okay, and it took that malicious code, uh, ran it, and then the, the GameCube was, was rooted in that way, and then you could start playing um, other um, unlicensed games on the GameCube. With the Nintendo Wii, uh, uh, anyone play Zelda The Twilight Princess? Fantastic, uh, lots of people. Fantastic game uh, that launched with the Wii. Um, there was a buffer overflow in the, the game's handling of save game files. So when you saved your game in, in Zelda, you could take that save game file and put it on an SD card, so you could take it to a friend's house and play it on their system. Um, what attackers were able to figure out is if you opened up that save game file and modified the attribute for the name of Link's horse that, was, that, that the character could modify, and you made that a malicious value, when the game read that in on, on uh, loading the save game file, it would execute a buffer overflow attack, and you could root the, the Wii. So you can, the, the developers here, kind of like on the original Nintendo, where they, the designers of Nintendo weren't thinking that uh, someone would make a malicious cartridge to send negative five volts of power to the Nint Nintendo, with the Zelda developers, they thought, well, we're the only ones writing the save game file. All of the inputs are constrained by the, the, the characters on the screen that we're you know, forcing the player into. They didn't think that someone would, would hack that. Um, so you always need to check your inputs here. And then finally, the Nintendo Switch. So the Nintendo Switch came out earlier this year. Um, I picked mine up, uh, it's, it's great. Uh, but like all you know, new systems, it comes with a web browser and the Switch comes with a, a version of WebKit. And the version that they shipped with happened to be six months old, and there was known CVEs in WebKit with that version. And so untrusted code was running on the Switch uh, pretty quickly after its release. Now, to Nintendo's credit, I'm sure that the version of WebKit that they shipped with, or that they 
they cut their kind of gold master width was probably the most recent, but due to manufacturing time and distribution delays, you know, it's going to get old and, CV and uh, vulnerabilities are going to be discovered. So it's really a, a very difficult problem um, uh, to solve here. Um, and just shows that, you know, with all of these newer systems, um, it's much more easier to attack the software than it is the hardware in the media. So for those who have beaten Mega Man 2, you'll recognize that this is the ending screen. So we've, we've reached the end of our presentation today. Um, so what I want to leave you with is by examining the attacks of the various game consoles throughout history, we can learn th security principles that we can apply to the software and the systems that we build today. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you.